Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Institute for South Asia Studies. I am Kanita Kala, and I'm the program director here. And it is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Alice Clark. Um, Dr. Clark is a historian and scholar of gender and society in India. She earned her PhD in comparative world history at the University of Wisconsin Madison, after which she came to UC Berkeley as a postdoctoral fellow in demography in 1984. And since then, Dr. Clark has had a very long standing relationship with us. First, we were the center, and now we're the institute. And uh, she has been affiliated as a research associate, which I just found out today for almost 12 years, from 1990 to 2002. And then uh, she was with us as a visiting scholar in, nine, in 2008 and 2009. So that is when I was here. So that's how I kind of got to know you. Um, Dr. Clark has written countless articles, including a series of articles focused on determinants of sex discrimination and female child mortality in India. And these were sort of published while she was a research associate at the then center, now institute. Her articles have been published in many respected journals, including the Journal of Women's Studies, Gender, Technology, and Development, and the Economic and Political Weekly. Her articles have also been included as chapters in various edited volumes, including one titled Women in Colonial India, Work, Survival, and the State, published by Oxford University Press in 1989. She herself is the editor of a volume titled Gender and Political Economy, Explorations of South Asian Systems, a set of contributions on gender and political economy in India that was published by the Oxford University Press in 1993. Additionally, Dr. Clark has given many invited lectures, served as a consultant on women's and diversity issues in several countries, and lived in India for long periods of time. Dr. Clark has taught world history and Indian history at numerous colleges and universities around the Bay Area, including um, UC Berkeley's Extensions online course on the culture of India. Today, we will hear Dr. Clark talk uh, about her latest publication, a book titled Valued Daughters, First Generation Career Women, a book that looks at the transition of agency and self-identity in young women aspiring for a career. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Clark. Uh, I just want to add copies of the books uh, of the book are available for sale, and you know if you're interested, we can help you buy one after the talk. Thank you very much, Punita, and thanks to the institute, and especially thanks to Lawrence, who couldn't be here but wanted to be here. I appreciate his facilitating my being here. Um, the book covers a, a wide range of topics, and I'm not able to cover all of them, so I have made some selections and extracts from the book to share with you, to give you a flavor of the book. But there are many questions that uh, the book covers that I'm not going to cover in this talk. Hopefully, you will ask me something about them. The book is actually partly very um, <coughs> quantitative, and that's a part that I'm not covering. And then partly it deals with the telling of stories of young women seeking careers. And I do focus on that because I think it makes for a more interesting talk. Female college students seeking careers in India now often represent caste and class backgrounds that are new. Some families, which restricted women's ambitions in the generation when the mothers were young, are now sponsoring the professional ambitions of their daughters. This trend of generational gender change affects particular families at a time of rapid economic and demographic change, sometimes also in the context of the thinning of their social support network. This research reflects a shift of my focus from the devaluation of daughters to those who are being valued. My book is meant to set an example of qualitative social demography supported by small-scale interviews. The sample base is made up of 36 urban college girls who are confident 
of having lifetime careers whose mothers never had one. My subjects were introduced to me by their professors, and I interviewed them at their campuses in 2013-14. Students who qualified for the study turned out, without my planning this, to be either only children, one of a family of girls only, or the eldest child with a younger brother, important demographic factors in new daughter-valuing families. The daughters are very assertive about their professional ambitions and are being strongly supported by their fathers. Many are also committed to help support their parents in old age, a role held by sons in similarly placed families. Some families have moved from elsewhere to more cosmopolitan environments seeking broader opportunities. Priya in Baroda is the eldest in a family of three daughters, no sons. Her family's from Rajasthan of the Agrawal community. They moved to Baroda 20 years earlier. Priya was 25 and a postgraduate student in interior design when we met. She has built a resume and career path that includes a job with an architect, a current postgrad research project on ergonomic kitchen design, the prospect of becoming a lecturer in her university department and the hope of starting a freelance design business as well. It's not only her father, but also her local uncles who support Priya's ambitions. The father and brothers are all in business in Baroda together. Relatives in Rajasthan are now hounding them, demanding to know why isn't she married yet. Her father's searching for a groom for Priya who will suit her. She says he's very stressed by the conflict between her demands and those of the Rajasthan family, but leaning hard towards her side. She wants him to find a husband and in-laws who are in favor of a woman who earns, which the Rajasthan relatives do not approve of. And she insists that she will not move back to the north, but must be located in Baroda, Ahmedabad, or Mumbai. Conflicted relations are developing between the gender expectations of the wider family back home and the cosmopolitan urban culture of Baroda as this in-migrant family acclimatizes to a social environment that allows more freedom to women. This causes great uneasiness to Priya's mother, but her father is championing her. She's very promising, doing unique research She's vocal in her criticism of the restrictions placed on her mother and cousins. Her father wants to make it possible for her to fulfill her career potential, searching for a broad-minded marital family. Once she completes her degree and is hired to teach in her department, she has the potential to become a successful faculty member and businesswoman. Her ability to remain an active professional will depend on her marital family traditional caste mores would have to be modified in such a marriage arrangement. Vimla, age 22, is also, an old, uh, is also an eldest child, but has a younger sister and brother, and lives with her family on the outskirts of Allahabad. She's writing a DPhil dissertation combining feminism, philosophy, and education studies. The family is entirely supported by Vimla's Junior Research Fellowship of 19,200 rupees per month until she finishes her doctoral degree and gets a job. She is proudly articulate about this. They moved to Allahabad in stages from their native village where her father had been a farmer. He has a college degree. The mother is illiterate. They are Yadav in caste village people who made an exit from a joint family where instances of violence against women could be witnessed by the children. This is not the climate I want my children to grow up in, Vimla's father said when he moved them to the nearby town. He then gave up his employment in a shop in order to move the family to Allahabad to provide a home for his three children through college. She speaks with great respect of his action, and Vimla's family are proud of her accomplishments. 
Bimbo says, when my father arranges a meeting with a prospective groom, I will spend some months talking with him. He must want a woman's freedom and participation in decision making. She uses a strikingly insistent tone. Her family relies on her income and actively endorses her professionalism. She's becoming the standard bearer for her family and expectations placed on her grow, grow along with her accomplishments. She intends to help see her younger siblings educated. She expects no dowry. Her earning capacity is expected to suffice. The challenge of these expectations is outweighed by her transformation into something bigger than what a member, a woman of her community used to be. Vimla declares, I will be a professor. My career plan is to get my DPhil and continue working up to age 65. I love my teaching and my students. My passion is to be a teacher. Like all the women I interviewed, she was assertive about her demands regarding her marriage. My questionnaire included, will you continue to work after marriage? Each young woman answered, yes, of course, as if there could simply be no question about it. My question about whether they would accept a request for a dowry was answered with a retort, of course not. <laughs> they stated that they would insist upon any potential partner in his family agreeing to those terms. Vimla's Yad of Caste, which holds power in UP, has a virulently conservative majority. This nuclear family has split from the wider village family, and her parents insist their daughters should be allowed and encouraged to be achievers. The father has to protect them, not just from strangers, but from members of their own community. Vimla's hedged about by controls because of security reasons. Can a woman with such limited permission to move about freely find a supportive mate coming from some part of her community? Vimla's father will have to persist in finding a supportive spouse in order to meet his own ambitions for this nuclear family's advancement to a more professional level. As such, these ambitions will not suffice for Vimla. She wants more to be able to grow and flourish as a scholar and teacher. Neela is the second daughter in a Baroda family of two daughters, no sons. And she might not even have had the chance to be born. Neela's mother was urged by her mother-in-law not to have a second daughter. And so she arranged for an abortion. But my husband said, we will not tell her that we are having another daughter. So I canceled the appointment, the mother told me. Neela was born into the Patidar community and at age 21 was in her final year for the BSc in fashion design when we met. Her father's a bank manager with a business degree her mother's college education had been interrupted so that she could marry and move to Baroda. Neela said, I am career oriented as my parents prefer. Rather than having me sit at home, they want me to support myself. I'll make sure my husband knows I'm not going to stop working. And he can convey this to his parents. <laughs> Ladies of my mom's age will not be working, but today's generation is more career oriented. I want to choose my own husband. Parents say, if you have a boyfriend, it will be fine as long as, he's he, as long as he is a Gujarati Hindu. They'll see to it that he's educated and making a living. I will give my parents some of my money because they have no son. Neela's mother told me, any Gujarati will be fine, but the couple should understand each other. Profession is their priority. I want a well-educated guy from a good family who are not necessarily so educated, but are capable of understanding their daughter-in-law. More people now see that education and profession are priorities. This family has fairly lost its village roots. The father's family, after moving to Baroda, used to live together in the city and support one another. Later, they all split up to pursue separate lives. Professionalism became the priority in this nuclear brain. The parents' hopes for mates for these two daughters do not rest on caste any longer, but now rely on professionalism. 
The parents will have emotional needs with no son to supply them, so they require their daughters to have some freedom of mind and some sense of personal agency. They are moving forward as members of a more generic, educated urban middle class, trying to find educated, broad-minded husbands for their girls from within that pool. They allow the possibility that they may have to go outside their caste to find compatible partners for their two daughters. The loss of the tight connections available to more conventional caste members has made it possible or even necessary for this urbanized family to live in this newer way. A career-minded young woman's staunchest supporter before marriage and sometimes even after is her father, with her mother following along in his wake. Some men, even if from very traditional backgrounds, have given up the notion that having a son is the sine qua non of the social reproduction of their family writ small. They seek to sustain a micro-level family unit. Rejecting the very idea of a sex-selective abortion, Neela's parents have found satisfaction in their small family of two daughters instead. The, fa the father is a man from a community once mainly comprised of farmers Patidars have a hierarchy of prestige within which this family's marriage circle is of a much lower rank. Some subgroups years ago sought to become known as queen caste people to raise the status of their community, but now some ranks of Patidars are seeking other backward caste status, claiming reservations set aside for that designation in an ironic contrast to the fact that many of them are well off. <clears throat> the movement to seek OBC status does not apply to Neela's parents. Since their own childhoods, they have carried a more middle class status. Neela's mother's father was a college teacher, and her father's father was a village landholder. The family is now socially distant from its village roots, visiting village relatives rarely, and not feeling at home with them. To aspire to marry daughters into the higher rung, of the Patidar hierarchy, where higher education more commonly prevails, would require a huge dowry and be prohibitively expensive. Neela's father would not benefit from thinking of his two daughters as social alliance material within his own caste. Clearly, he also did not think he required a son to attract another family to send its daughter to his as a method of elevating the respect of his family. <coughs> the family story shows a marked change in gender relations going hand in hand with a change in the family's intra-caste relations. There's a loosening of their links within their own caste compared with the situation when Mila's mother was a young girl and her father told her that she must marry a man from the correct marriage circle as more required for her happiness than fulfilling her own wish to go to medical school. For this father's priorities to have shifted so far in privileging his two daughters, maintaining intra-caste relations has lost its mandatory force. Mila will become a fashion designer, her elder sister a dentist. These roles are of greater interest to their parents than finding families with which they might form alliances in their own caste. Families I studied saw their daughters as important to invest in because they needed to prepare them to be self-supporting. Resources for doing otherwise were scarce. There was no emphasis on saving up for a large dowry. Why waste her talents and consign her to marriage alone when she can clearly shine in education and career, too? Why not do so with great pride, with thoughts I gleaned from the fathers? Whether the family would find a husband within the same caste for the daughter, while upholding her ambitions, was unclear. But supporting their daughters appeared to be their chief aim rather than maintaining caste loyalties. Caste loyalty has thus receded in some cases. What seems to be happening is a drawing in of the boundaries to a smaller and closer set of relatives who depend on one another. 
a flattening out of the octopus-like shape of the once my much wider solidarity network, which had its own strict internal hierarchy as well as many tentacles. The wider network had been one of authority and rules as well as of people. Some of its authority is being sapped out here. Lower middle caste backgrounds and rural to urban mobility each seem to smooth the disjuncture between parents' backgrounds and their educated daughters' hopes, loosening some of the gender mores that have prevailed in the wider caste community. To have daughters who are permitted to be born when sons do not come along can mean being willing to invest in them. Once a daughter is welcomed and valued, she may be able to grow beyond the calculation of value in her family, becoming her own new kind of person. If she convinces her parents she can do well and will stay in their network, supporting them as much as a son would have done, they become allies in her cause. She must then gain the compliance of her marital family with her plan of having a lifelong career. Finding career compliant families into which to marry their daughters is very important to these parents who have moved outside their strict caste backgrounds to provide new opportunities and advantages for their offspring and themselves. But what is most insistently claimed by the young women is that they be free to move into the careers they're preparing themselves for so they can grow and develop professionally. They need to create a strong self-identity in order to make sense of the contrast in notions about gender they understand they represent. Their own professional imaginary, that is, cuts a different path than that of their parents. These young women are caught up in a growing professional imaginary, a phenomenon characterizing people located in both the old and the new middle classes. Within this frame, young women are now seeking self-identities that they could not seek before. While these newly forming self-identities spring from aspirational families encouraging their daughters to take up careers, at the same time they also represent deeper underlying demographic and socioeconomic forces. Today's aspirational families encompass members of a rising part of the middle class, including many not coming from upper caste or class backgrounds. My subjects are studying in the English language, and one of their favorite words is exposure, meaning global awareness. They connect with a wider world via saturated media and communications technology. With global exposure, they're able to view a visible swath of women around the globe growing more powerful or struggling vocally to do so. An impetus toward shaping oneself as a person can also be driven by demographic and economic change, leading the way and facilitating cultural and political change. Professionalism is an elastic and multipliable category very useful to assess at this juncture. It is an important factor to be considered in making a self-identity. Since the late 1980s, India began to produce newer and more varied career opportunities for its, more of its educated people. The unemployment situation women face is a serious challenge, which I, in, which I detail at length in the book. But within employment, there are more choices and more roles to play, given the talent, skill, and training for the particular job opportunity and being in the right place to find it. Urban centers are by far the best hope for educated careers. In looking into women's growing sense of self-identity, professionalization is a rich part of the process. How professional self-identity can be arrived at and held on to tenaciously throughout a person's life is a major challenge, involving a lifelong commitment to increasing one's skill development set of accomplishments, and professional advancement. This task has up to recently been carried out mainly by people who start out with certain advantages. 
Today's young female career aspirants may or may not start out with social advantages, but they seek meaningful lives with careers that provide service, employ knowledge, attain respect and dignity, and hold a kernel of moral force. <coughs> Looking now at the capabilities of each young woman to become a full-fledged professional will provide background to further discussion of what I call the professional imaginary. The capability for each one to succeed reflects one usage of that word suggested by Amartya Sen, in that it falls within the context of the woman's broader circumstances. Each young woman interviewed possesses an assertiveness capability that far outstrips that of her mother. The question is whether each one is likely to have the circumstantial capability to succeed in becoming fully professional. Vimla in Allahabad is hedged about by controls imposed by her father, probably out of sheer necessity. Well versed in philosophy and so feminist theory, her professionalism as a scholar and teacher is already in place. She has great force of character. But fuller professionalization will depend on her family finding a supportive mate coming from within her faction riven community. In Baroda, Mila has elegance, fluent English, and design talent. Through her artistic abilities, she is likely to fit into a fashion niche called professional in today's terminology. Priya has a dynamic personality, an impressive resume, and a teaching job waiting. Both these Baroda girls have cast communities in the background, uttering disapproval. The assertiveness capability these women possess is a great strength if their circumstances permit them to begin their careers, which will depend on other people's demands on them. But with the assertiveness they have been encouraged to develop, most will continue to make their own demands on others, to a greater extent than their mothers did. If they find a place in the work world, they will be more likely to hold on to it and develop it further. The circumstantial capability to do so, however, will have to be buttressed by supportive husbands and in-laws. These are, in fact, more likely to appear in their lives than was the case for the previous generation. Young, would-be, middle-class women are in a critical position. Like their male peers, they want professional jobs and supportive, well-employed spouses. The men they're introduced to will mainly want employed wives. Preferably, both spouses will be employed, but women's jobs are more expendable than men's, and men's employment has remained a reliable mainstay under unquestioned patriarchal conditions. These conditions re may remain unquestioned or they may begin to be undermined. There are several different kinds of professionalism. The notion originally pertained to the traditional professions, prestigious demanding careers access through education with rigorous entry criteria for required postgraduate degree studies. There are now increasing ranks and levels in business and organizational structures that require qualifications, for example, human resources. There is also a more current, less elevated notion of professions referring to any career informed by specific training. These are now marked by certificates and new degree programs, which multiply by the decade. Currently, we see the word professional spreading as a descriptor of lifestyle characteristics seen as both modern and middle class. The word professionalism seen in the broad expansion of this word is of an aspirational kind, relating both to increased credentialism imposed from above and to the search for personal dignity and social inclusion that people wish to have attributed to themselves. The urban middle-class professional imaginary as applied to women is heavily tied to a consist continued insistence upon family. The careers of a family's children, like their marriages, are a family project. The daughters I'm looking at are projected to succeed on both fronts, each of which may contribute to the welfare and prestige of the family. The 
within the professional imaginary of most of the young women themselves, there's a hope for a future encompassing a very carefully calibrated compound of professionalism and marriage. A woman envisions obtaining one or more degrees, beginning her career, and marrying later than women of an earlier generation. Her years of educational preparation should ideally not be followed by marriage. As Shruti, another of my Allahabad subjects, puts it, I want to go through a phase when I'm not married, where I'm into my career, and I'm not all that much monitored. A young educated woman may tacitly wish for a little space of her own before marriage, but she also envisions a hoped-for refuge within her marriage. Her vision includes these elements. She will marry an egalitarian, helpful, highly qualified, and well-settled man. His parents will comply with their daughter-in-law's career, keeping her away from household duties most of the day. They will cooperate in helping care for the children and making life easier for the couple. This set of requirements seems essential for her career to thrive. But there is a more frankly feminist professional imaginary, which may sort more uneasily with the growing middle class professional imaginary. It involves pushing forward the boundary of women's rights and claiming one's own rights as such. If women become successfully employed, we can advocate for women within the organizations they work for. If they don't find what they seek and have to accept lesser jobs, they will still remain charged with a sense of possibility, which like their forebears, they will pass on. And whether employed or not, they may seek on their own to become activists for women. Or they may become satisfied with their superiority, exploitive of others less qualified, reinforcing the fetters of the class system that is emerging with its roots in the caste hierarchy. This cross cuts the progress that is also possible. <coughs> Fernandez refers to the rise of what is being called a new middle class as a cultural and normative political project which helps shape the terms of development and national identity. In regard to middle class identity, many well-regarded works emphasize the process of keeping up appearances. Savala's 2010 study of women in Hyderabad who are climbing towards the middle class emphasizes the social formalities they learn to conform to and the rituals they learn to perform. Middle class aspirations are seen to be shaped around consumerism and geared toward appearances and political one-upsmanship. This understanding of the middle class can appear as a scrim of cultural and political construction floating visibly on top of a seething mass of economic and personal struggle. Performativity in the writings of authors mentioned can sometimes almost seem to congeal a person's actions and limit her freedom of choice about how to think, a la Bourdieu. Seeing class behavior in terms of appearances is one framework for viewing how people operationalize their aspirations, operationalize their aspirations. But in this study, some daughters who are first born or only children, especially in the lower earning category, are now playing very new roles in their natal families. This represents more than an appearance of status and more than a cultural shift alone. It is a structural reordering of gender relations within some particular segments of an enormous and changing class. As this occurs, actors are finding new openness for thinking differently about themselves and their roles, their hopes, and their opportunities. It will be important in future to do more research on daughter valuing families and valued daughters' careers. What women's lives are for and what their roles are supposed to be include parenthood and child rearing. Marriage is mandatory and inescapable, but age at marriage responds closely to the time of completion of education. Where parents are supportive of a girl's gaining higher educational credentials, they are now willing to postpone her marriage to a later time than previously. They either conduct the marriage immediately after she gains the credentials she seeks, or hold off for a couple of years more so she can become established in her career. 
required marriage, insistence on its taking place soon after education completion, and women's responsibility for household maintenance and almost obligatory childbearing, childbearing are all components of a system of social reproduction, one which is taken for granted and which very few of the people in my sample can imagine will ever change. But it is likely that change is taking place not only on inside the household but beyond it will come to alter that realm in more ways than people currently imagine. The reproductive program for today's young women, including support from parents for the raising of only one or two children while young adults pursue careers, is a vision inextricably nested in the late stage of a demographic transition. Beginning in the 1970s, improved health began to leave behind the unavoidable predominance of death crises for families to have to deal with. As mortality declined, people could voluntarily reduce their complete fertility using modern methods. These unfortunately came to include sex selective abortion, which has increased the masculinity of total births despite the survival of many more girls than it destroyed. We do not know what gender composition many parents might have originally wanted, but surviving daughters are valued in families according to their birth order and the gender composition emerging within the completed set of children. Career-minded young women, as we have seen, are especially valued in families of particular compositions. The largest part of their increased value is due to the education they're able to attain and make use of. It's because of a remarkable change in the expected usefulness of educated daughters to their natal families that more of them are being actively valued and invested in during this current era. <clears throat> the first decade of the 21st century began a different period for young women coming of age, one in which included the re-knitting of bonds of loyalty. Some families are moving away from absolutely requiring sons to grasping a new idea, spreading among old and new middle classes, the idea of encouraging and investing in educated, professional, yet highly loyal daughters. <coughs> a remitting of loyalty bonds, a reformulation of solidarity units, capitalizing on closeness between parents and daughters, is now occurring in some families. These are either urban or in-migrant families. One or both parents have some education, but not as much as they had wanted. There are either no sons or only one younger son, and there are one or more daughters. Now that there are families with very few children, some of, are of this newer daughter valuing type, even though these are not a dominant proportion. Some of the constraints on female options have been reduced and new possible opportunities have appeared. These options now appeal to families with daughters who prove themselves scholastically promising. The bonds of loyalty in some families have thereby been rearranged, and this is done partly for the purpose of maintaining a woman's extended natal family as a solidarity unit for a longer time. Ultimately, the family of a woman's in-laws will be the unit that she supports, yet ties with her own parents promise to remain stronger than those traditionally sanctioned. Parents need children to help them in their old age. Own daughters are beginning to fill some of these roles. The solidarity of a daughter with her own parents may continue much more strongly than it used to after marriage. <coughs> this rearrangement of family bonds is based on the demographic rates and resulting age structures of the moment. Future rates and age structures will continue to change. If gender roles don't change further as the demographic transition continues, middle-aged married women may face increasing responsibilities caring for elderly family members. In contrast, greater professionalism will change the willingness of women to stay at home as the young women of today grow older in-laws may still be pursuing their careers when their grandchildren come along. Pursuing their own human rights, 
professional women may form find more attraction than their forebears did. However committed they are to the good of their families, they'll also be oriented towards success as individuals. We may hope that these assertive and confident students of today adopt progressive positions and promote these with strong voices. There also may be polite lifestyle spillovers to other groups, cities, and regions from the example of young, educated urban women being <coughs> believing in themselves. They will hold out for greater equality even in marital families where their wishes are challenged. The generation of educated women with hopes and plans for long, lifelong professionalism may put in place a pattern of expectations that pushes greater equality for women forward faster than in the past. Young, urban, middle-class women and would-be middle-class women occupy social locations very different from those their mothers did at their ages. And they are very aware of this. A change has been made in the system of gender relations in their own families and family networks. And this does not escape them living as they do along the front margin of this visible change, they are conscious of it, even as they still emerge embedded in family, though not exactly in the same way their mothers did. The embedded self is not always and for forever an unconscious self. Walking away from subordination as subject formation is occurring, young women see it and name it and lay claim to their power to change it even if only in part. In this way, a young woman may become a conscientized social actor, far more than her supporters ever intended. Thank you. Would you like to just take your own question? Yes, certainly. And are there any questions? Could you say more about the term imaginary? But there's a, a use of <coughs> making that adjective into a noun in mm -hmm. a lot of post-colonial uh, post writing. So there's, there's a common use of it in Indian studies of a, the, the national imaginary. So the national imaginary is, is a sort of project that is assumed to be kind of in the atmosphere, in people's minds, and um, to carry them forward on a sense, with a, with a sense of um, inevitability. Now, I, I don't think that the national imaginary is, is useful for me in this study, but I thought that adapting it to the, the project of remaking the middle class was a useful place to use this concept. The professional imaginary seemed to work well with the growing middle class and the growing ambitions or aspirations of middle class people, especially middle class women. So that's where that comes from. Yes? What's your, um, what's the theoretical framework for linking professional daughters to valued daughters, especially where it seemed that both professional and non-professional daughters were useful in terms of social mobility? So what's yes. the link between Yes, you're values? absolutely right. Non-professional daughters are very useful in terms of social mobility through being raised to marry and often given a dowry in order to make that link with a higher, higher level family. So there's a great deal of that background. L lower, um, <coughs> lower ranks can rise into higher ranks through the passing of daughters. So there's reference to that in the book. But uh, in terms of what is the theoretical background to compare professional and non-professional daughters. So the professional daughters I was looking at in relation to work by Amartya Sen and work by Pierre Bourdieu to try to understand the self-making, the self-making process. And the se I was interested in the self-identity of young women more than in professionalism until I went and did this research because I found that their self-identity, the making of self-identity that was of interest to them was around becoming a professional. So the theoretical framework that 
that um, Sam provided it was was very useful. But my question is also valued by whom and in what sense? Yes, valued by whom and in what sense? So valued daughters in this sense is used in an opposition to the devaluation of daughters that results in sex selective abortion or neglect of little girls. So there's been a lot of literature about devalued daughters, but I hadn't seen any literature growing up about valued daughters, but still it's worth going back and saying, let's look at the traditional roots of valuing daughters. The traditional roots of valuing daughters are found in books about marriage and dowry and so on, like I Give Thee My Daughter by Van Deveen, which is about the gift of a daughter in marriage, that how, how many blessings that brings to the family who gives a daughter. So you value, certainly you value a daughter if you're in a traditional setup like that, as a, uh, <clears throat> a precious gift that you can give to another family, and also as a precious child growing up in your family. I mean, any, any daughter who is not neglected or wiped out is probably loved and cared for, but within the traditional framework of, of North Indian culture, it's going to be goodbye to that daughter in order to, you know, you're going to value the daughter until she gets married, and then there's this great distance that is supposed to occur between <coughs> the families. But that's not true in all the regions of India, or all the social strata of India, but still there's this background assumption in talking about valued daughters that um, that we're talking about them in opposition to devalued daughters. There's a lot more that can be said about this. Would you like to say anything more about it? Um, it seems a low threshold with which to talk about feminist empowerment, <laughs> not being abused and neglected, right? Yes, um, yes, absolutely. Very low threshold for feminist empowerment. You're absolutely right about that. It's a very low threshold. Um, the, the thing that, that struck me, though, that why I wanted to do this research is because of the personalities of the girls that I was meeting in India in previous visits that was growing more and more assertive, and I wanted to understand what that was about. What it's about is this great, greater freedom to expect that they can have lifetime professions now, having a lifetime profession is then going to allow them become, to become more feminist empowered. They may not go that way, but absolutely I felt that the women I talked to might very well go that way, that they would catch on. I mean, and also I was meeting a lot of women who had taken women's studies courses, so they actually talked about feminist empowerment. Especially this woman, Vimla, she was a feminist woman, teacher, and yet she was going to not be fully empowered in terms of her community and in terms of her marriage. It, it, the, the contradiction was very interesting. But it, it, the book is not about feminist empowerment. Feminist empowerment is much, you know, more exciting direction to get to than where we've gotten yet. Yes. In the talk, I think you, you brought out a couple a couple of factors that sort of causal in this in this change, looking at the demographic shifts, looking at sort of changing family family structures and, and ties to larger caste groups that I think perhaps we could think of as, as being tied to some underlying economic shifts in India. I was wondering where in, in your discussion you would place to think about some of the government campaigns that have gone on to try to, you know, whether it's baby Bachao, save the girl child, those, those sorts of campaigns, did, did those have any impact on the people you were, you were interviewing, or are those not playing into this dynamic? They did, and especially with the even further low caste groups in which I found young women studying for careers, they had had the benefit of free education, free college education, which young men don't have. And many of them had also benefited from reservations. 
and expected to benefit from reservations in their job search. So government programs were definitely in the background. But causally, um, you know, you can't imagine some of these girls coming up without government programs, but there are a lot of other sets of causes in terms of the changing in the economy, the changing in the demographic structure of the population, and the changing um, <coughs> relationship of families to the economy. I mean, there's just a lot more of that in the book. Yes? And now, uh, Modi has come with a uh, caption that Betty Bachao, Betty Padao. That's actually reaching uh, the large sections of the people in India. And uh, he's also giving free education for a uh, girl child. Keeping that aside. Uh, well, the thing is, I finished my research just, yeah, be yeah, I know, I just know. before yeah. the election, about three months uh, before. But, uh, coming back to you, uh, your book, what made you to select only these few uh, women from. I think they're not first in. Their second generation also. Then, uh, their second generation what? Uh, because some of their uh, parents are educated, they're employed, right? Bank. This is not a study of people in the poorest sectors. That is true. Okay. It's a study of people who are either middle class, but they never had women work never have women have careers, never have women have professional identities. Actually, this middle class, middle caste segment that I found myself with in, in where, where the, my criterion was that the mothers had never worked. So then I found myself in this middle caste, middle level s sector. Some of those women were educated. Uh, that is to say, I went to their homes, the mothers were educated. And they had never chosen to be involved in a career. Now, I was told about Neela's mother being told by her father that getting married to the right person in the right section, in, in, in the right village circle, was more important for her happiness than going to medical school and becoming a doctor. So that was the one who had wanted to be a professional. But many of the women who were the mothers had never wanted to be a professional. Some of them had master's degrees. And I was able to remember having known people in that situation in earlier decades. So I was interested, as I went back to India more recently, in finding young women who were not going to put up with that, that sort of limitation. If they were going to be middle class educated women, they wanted to be middle class educated professional women. So, I mean, this is a change. It's, it's a, one of the changes that's happening. Yeah. Um, could you just talk a little bit about your sample size and the geographical sort of distribution of how you encountered your, you know, your, I mean, did you I went to, them? I went to three did different cities. them over there? I went to three different cities in 2013-14. Uh, in, in 2005, I had gone to Bangalore. I had some uh, examples there already. But then in 2013, I went to Allahabad, mm -hmm. and <coughs> I was situated in the Women's Studies Department, gave some lectures there. Professors there in introduced me to their students. Um, I, I spoke to students in two or three different faculties at the University of Allahabad, introduced by their professors. Now the interesting thing about the professors is that they were keen to cooperate with this because they wanted their students to succeed. They liked the fact that young women now, who are their students, are likely to go out and do something with the education rather than just getting married. Some of these professors have been waiting for a long uh, time. Now, there wasn't a, wasn't a very big sample. No, None I mean undergraduate uh, students? Or I had undergraduate and graduate students. I reported on a couple of those levels in the, in the paper just now. But you know, in your talk, actually, you were trying to, uh, you were trying to predict that you know, the caste system and uh, all the educated people are trying to you know, give up this caste system. But no, 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 there's no word all. 
There's no word all. No, I keep they, limiting it back to this very small sample of people who have only daughters or that they don't have sons to take on the traditional roles. There are families that have daughters and the daughters are doing very well in the college. It's, it's a very, very restricted sample. Mm -hmm. And it's a very restricted look at female aspiration. Female aspiration as seen in terms of a comparison from the, the last generation where there was more restriction. I'm curious, did you find a big difference between your work in Allahabad compared to Bangalore? Because you know there's this traditional sort of divide where the north, you know, family structures tend to be much more sort of I found that the women in both cities were equally ambitious, equally assertive, equally demanding because they were fitting into this particular subset that I was talking about with. Women who expect to have lifetime careers and are studying in college or graduate school and whose mothers never had a career. So they were, there was just as much en emphasis and enthusiasm among the students I met in Alaba. Think of the story of Vimla, who's the Yad of caste. She has, she has all these problems facing her, but she's very, very ambitious and strong. Now, if I were doing some kind of general sociological study, I could answer all of your questions. There seems to be a desire for me to have done a different study. But the study that I did do was very interesting in finding that there's n not that much difference between that type of student from the North and from the South. And in fact, when I did the quantitative work, I saw that the gender gap in education is reducing faster in UP than it is anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this ri there's a rise of women and a rise of educated women mm -hmm. that is going along very, very fast and is not necessarily being written about very much. Hi. Hi. So um, when they do have children, do they need to rely on the family structures to help them or There's no there social security program in India. When parents get old, they need somebody, and hopefully it's going to be some of their own children to help help them have a good old age. But, but also for, for raising young children, they need to rely on Oh, well, they could, they could hire some folks to oh, come okay. into the house. There's a lot of, a lot of um, servant hiring in the middle class. And well, it's also very different from here. Yeah. Because the, I think the larger family network is much stronger. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, you don't have a single unit kind of family mm -hmm. that you have mm -hmm. in the US. So it's a lot of people who take care of children. Mm -hmm. Although you've mentioned leaving the villages and then being more isolated from, from those families. They were isolated from their larger families, yeah. that's true. Mm -hmm but they expected to do a lot within the family that they did. They expected that, for example, the uh, parents of the girl were offering to babysit for their daughter's children if they should need to have help. And that, that's very unusual. Usually, um, the woman goes and lives with her in-laws and she separates from her own parents and only the in-laws are supposed to uh, respond to the family needs of that family. But in the cases of most of these girls, they were also envisioning calling their parents to come over and help them when they were going to have babies. So, um, <coughs> do you have some more questions? So, uh, in India, we do have this uh, old age schemes. And old age schemes, which, which you, you fund yourself. You so the government gives us uh, pension. Uh huh. Health schemes now are obviously very decent funding. Are they a scheme? Are are they schemes that fund that are funded for everyone? Yeah, everyone pays for it. Okay, but I don't know how many people actually have access to those. Right? There's that problem of information. Many people don't sort of even. I mean, the structures are there, but how much is it really benefiting? Who knows? It seems also like a lot of the currents that are being discussed exist both 
in our context and in the Indian context, right? Mm -hmm. The separation of how it's a unique Indian problem is sometimes a little difficult to parse through. It's like in that case, where there are schemes, but the access is different, but there are schemes. And honor I'm still thinking about your question about the low bar for feminist empowerment <laughs> because it's a really good question. My, my picture is that these changes within the middle class will lead to more activist uh, and, and aware women who will get more political, and especially nowadays when there's so much mass activity and so many protest movements. I think some of these young women are going to take that from college right into their adulthood and be more politically aware and active. Whereas middle class people in the past have been extremely docile. I mean, the women I used to know 40 and 50 years ago in India who were middle class, middle aged housewives, they were very, very docile and would not want to talk about politics or you know have any outgoing and wanted to keep things kind of within the circle of the family. So I think I'm hopeful that political awareness is growing with education, and especially with the fact that women's studies has become common in all the universities in India. And many people are taking women's studies, including the young men. And there, so there's, there's a, a rising consciousness about some of the political issues for women. <coughs> Feminism can be can be carried by men too. We have met some of them, some of the young men in the demonstrations. So, um, you know, feminist empowerment is it, if, it, if you were going to set that up as a separate study, you would probably want to talk to women who were in women's movements, or women who were in political active movements, or in protest movements. <coughs> Yes. So you've described this narrowed down group of people that you selected from with, from within the broader group that you might have talked to. But I'm also wondering how one would imagine these women that you did study and that cohort of people fitting that category uh, would see themselves being um, different uh, than the other women that well, the, were the in women those classes that maybe the professors decided not to recommend to you, or you know, would would there be some kind of consciousness that they were pursuing something that the other women uh, were not in this that? Did you get any flavor I, I sometimes met with a group of young women in a classroom in order to uh, cull them down to see who fit my criteria. And definitely there were those who were um, kind of sailing along through college and just going to college because they were supposed to go to college but didn't have any ambition. And then there were also people who didn't have any responsibility either. So what, what I ended up with was some women who needed to have professions because they were ambitious and smart and also had responsibilities. Um, it was clear that that made a difference. That being, being the only daughter or the eldest daughter was a responsibility, it put responsibility on these people. Now that's a, a segment, a limited segment and Certainly, feminist empowerment needs to happen among young women who have older brothers. I felt that very strongly when I led a talk of some kids in Allahabad at the university, at the law school, and I tried to talk to them about the um, different statements within the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Well, one of the de one of the declarations is. Uh, the right to property, and as you know, the right to property has been expanded to include women in India recently. But these young women who were in this seminar with me 
didn't want to have anything to do with the right to property because that would mess up their relationship with their brothers. And yet they were all very enthusiastic about the right to bodily integrity because that would protect them. That would give them a sense that they had a right not to be abused. But the right, the, a right which is there, in the, in, not only in the International Declaration, Universal Declaration, but also in Indian law, they didn't want to get involved with yet. So I think it will take some but time. The situation in India is entirely different because you know, we have dowry system there. I know, that's yeah. a lot. Uh, so, uh, that's a, that, that's, yeah. that's, when, that's a lot of marriage discussion. Happens, you know, half of the amount uh, from the property will be sold out or something. Yes. And then again, if they get uh, the property right, then uh, it won't be enough for sharing. Well, that's the fear. And everybody stated it that way. But there must be some just way in which property could be divided up or dowry could be dispensed yes. with and a girl could have a, uh, a stake that she could you go out and use. In her own, on her own behalf. So they didn't want to do that. And while uh, alongside with this, there was that uh, judgment that said that if a woman did not take care of her in laws, she mm -hmm. could be she could be divorced. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, you know, husband has a right to divorce if he doesn't if take care of the in laws. Mm -hmm. If the wife refuses to take care yes. of the in laws. I mean, it is. Laos for divorce. I think it was in well, just recently. Just in one was it in Delhi or was it in Hyderabad? What was that? Mm -hmm. Delhi. Delhi. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm used to thinking of feminist activists as taking a lot of action around laws like that, and unjust, unjust laws or injustices as needed out by law. So I think the young women that I talked to in law school, I'll be looking forward to seeing what they do. That. Yes. Are you planning to follow up on any of these women or to see what happens? What happens if they don't find the man to marry they want to find? You know, what, In, what not formally. I don't plan formally to follow up, but I'm going to India in January and um, I may meet some of them and then I may be able to ask them or I may meet their professors. Their professors may come to listen to what I have to say. I can say what happened to so and so, and how did it work out? So I can get back to you about it in a <laughs> year or so. Well, I'd just be curious of how this whole kind of experiment is is proceeding, and you know, is it are women really being able to find what they're looking for? Women? I am curious about that too. <coughs> but what what was very interesting was that in 2005, when I was doing research in Bangalore. I had some colleagues who would come to me and say that it's, it's no use doing this research because they won't, they won't last. They won't be able to carry out their wishes. They are going to be you know, put into a, a marriage situation which won't allow it and their in-laws will not allow it. So there was this very down at the mouth kind of attitude about how could that possibly work. So I, I wanted to pursue it a little bit further and find women who were sure it was going to work and who I didn't want to force them to prove to me that it would work, but I wanted to find out why did they think so strongly that it would work. And of course I found out why. It's because they're in this special demographic position of being the only daughter or the eldest daughter and their fathers have had some kind of change of heart for their own reasons that they want to want to promote their daughters. I think it's a very small population segment. This is not like all of India, what is happening to all of India, or even all of the people in these four cities that I study. But I think that the more empowered women you get in each generation, the better off women will be. And the rise of women in education is very great. And as I say, it's been understudied. The huge um, reduction in the gap between men and women who are educated. So women are out there looking for these opportunities. And we, we don't know if they're going to find them, but they're, you know, strong in the gates, wanting to get something that they haven't necessarily wanted to get before. <coughs>